So my name is Father John Markey. I'm the director of the PhD in spirituality program and on behalf of um, Oblate School of Theology and our Institute for the Study of Contemporary Spirituality, I want to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, first night of, a, of our conference, which goes uh, all day tomorrow. For those of you who are only here, only knew about tonight, tomorrow we have a whole day lined up on mysticism and contemporary life. It's a um, conference honoring uh, Burnham McGinn, and uh, uh, we will be referencing him and his contribution to our field over the course of the next two days. Uh, it's enough to say tonight that uh, how important he is to say that David Tracy is the keynote at a conference in his honor. And um, one of the things I wanna say about David Tracy, there's a lot you can say about David Tracy. Um, I wanna say the most interesting thing is that, uh, that he and Bernie have known each other since 1952. They met on a bus, they're both from Yonkers, and they took the bus together to Cathedral High School and then into the seminary to Rome. They were both at Catholic U, um, left Catholic U on the same day <laughs> for reasons we won't get into, were hired the first Catholics to teach at the University of Chicago Divinity School and have been together ever since. And we, although very diverse careers and different uh, uh, folk, uh, foci, nevertheless, it's, it's, it's without hyperbole to say that two of the most important uh, contributions to Catholic theology in the United States are rode the bus together in, in, from Yonkers to downtown New York and uh, what a story and what a, what a uh, life both uh, represent. So tonight to lead off our, uh, our, our, our uh, meeting here, David, uh, Father Tracy, let me try to keep this professional. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, the one thing I actually printed this up because this is the most complicated part. He's the Thomas Greeley and Grace Nichols Greeley Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Catholic Studies at the University of Chicago Divinity School. That itself is a, a feat. He's published at least three books that everyone in this room better have read if they're, uh, if they're in uh, our students here. Most famous, of course, Blessed Rage for Order and the Analogical Imagination and Plurality and Ambiguity. He's published innumerable other works. Um, he, as I say, it is not hyperbole to say that he's, he's probably the most important or one of the mo two or three most important Catholic theologians in the United States after the Council, which makes him almost the imp most important Catholic theologian in the United States since there weren't that many before the Council. <laughs> Just realize that. Uh, but it's a, as a, uh, and so instead of giving a longer uh, opportunity, a longer introduction, um, you can look him up. He's got a long and extensive Wikipedia page, which is really how we just know whether people are important anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but I will say that it's an honor that he graces us uh, at Oblate with his presence and with, a, and uh, it's, a, I think, because to honor uh, uh, Dr. McGinn, who also uh, has really been a blessing to this place in more ways than most of us can say. Uh, so it's, it's, it's in, with the deepest gratitude that uh, I welcome both of, the, both of them, and especially Dr. Tracy, and invite him to share his thoughts. Dr. Tracy. Thank you very much, Father John Markey. We had a long talk my first night here. He's one of the most erudite men I've ever met. <laughs> it is 
a great honor to be here in this special place, this unique place that is more and more famous as the Theologic, where spirituality and theology actually come together and also have separate disciplines. It's quite impressive. And of course, it's a great honor for me to speak in honor of my older high school friend. <laughs> he was the, always the year ahead, still is. <laughs> and uh, I never realized in the early 50s, going on the buses and the subways with Bernard, who was very kind, I was lost a lot, <laughs> and he directed me. I never realized that I was going with the person who would be, as he most clearly is, the most distinguished scholar of Christian mysticism of our period in the world, not just in this country, but in the world. His scholarship is simply amazing. I've read most of his books, I've read all of his books, but. The ones on mysticism, I've read each one two or three times, they're so amazing, they're so rich. So it's good to speak in his honor and in Pat's honor. <laughs> Patricia McGinn, who also has written on mysticism and is an extraordinary person. I thought how I might add to the discussion since I'm no expert in spirituality, though I have some and I read it, is that, I thought, well, what would be, what could I, I thought I would speak about the influence of mysticism and mystical consciousness, especially contemplative consciousness, on the contemporary debate in philosophy and science and in fundamental theology on the nature of reason. <laughs> that might be worthwhile, I hope. <laughs> so. To affirm theology as the logos on theos is both to affirm its hermeneutical character and its fundamental agreement with Thomas Aquinas' insistence that theology indeed is a study of God and all things as related to God. Today we would even say, I think, that theology, like the Christian life, is mystical prophetic. At its deepest, Christian theology attempts the almost impossible task of thinking of the incomprehensible and infinite God, the ineffable triune God of Christianity and of Christian mystical prophetic way of life and way of thinking. Genuine theology includes both the positive aphatic symbols, images, and concepts manifested by the intrinsically self-disclosing triune God. I've been writing a book on God for about 10 years now, so I'm a little obsessed, especially on God related to the category of the infinite. <laughs> to understand any theological attempt to articulate the mystical nature of the infinite God more clearly, I shall have two parts to the Torah. In the first, I shall suggest what a mystical element can contribute to fundamental theology's understanding of reason. Fundamental theology, you know, tries to show the reasonableness of Christianity. That first form of theology which undertakes the specific task of articulating the reasonableness of Christianity for both thought and life. In other words, mystical consciousness affects not only faith, but also reason on my reading. <coughs> Fundamental theology, like systematic and practical theologies, is a radically hermeneutical discipline which attempts to correlate an interpretation of the complex, pluralistic, and at times ambiguous Christian tradition 
with a critical interpretation of the nature of reason in different cultural, social, political, and economic situations. On the side of its interpretation of reason, fundamental theology and theology generally is greatly guided, I'm going to claim, by mystical contemplation as understood by Bernard McGinn as an awareness of the presence of God. The key here, I suggest, is to see how rendering a mystical con contemplation as that awareness can both clarify and deepen the notion of reason itself, much debated today, an enterprise sorely needed in our mainly rationalistic, <coughs> but sometimes not very reasonable, intellectual world. Modern theology, modern rationality rather, from the 19th century scientific revolution in the 17th century forward, is distinct from classical reason. Usually modern speak of rationality, classically reason. <laughs> is a profound commitment to understanding rationality by means principally of the greatest modern triumph of reason the scientific revolution. Bernard Lonergan liked to quote Herbert Butterfield correctly, I think, in the claim that compared to the intellectual impact of a 17th century scientific revolution on Western culture, even the epoch making events of the Renaissance and the Reformation can seem like family quarrels. Scientific sense of discursive reason is, of course, based principally on empirical observations, and then with Galileo forward, mathematical formulations, experimental testing, and the repeatability of its conclusions. In further testing, as scientific reason in the 17th century was established by Galileo Descartes and Newton. <coughs> Bacon did not have the mathematical side. There is no turning back, in my judgment, in theology too, to a pre-modern scientific classical reason, usually Aristotle, without the addition of modern scientific reason. From the analogous proto-scientific notion of the empirical reasoning of Aristotle has been proved inadequate by Descartes and others in early modernity, principally first by Galileo's mathematizing of scientific reason. In fact, Galileo in that sense was more like Pythagoras and Plato than like Aristotle's empiricism. But Aristotle, after all, was extremely strong, you could say scientifically, he began as a marine biologist, <laughs> with strong observational powers. And as far as I can see, a person whose curiosity about everything was unlimited. <laughs> Dante was right to call him the one who knew. Knew what kind of argument and kind of evidence you needed for any given topic, poetics, rhetoric, metaphysics, etc., physics. <clears throat> In fact, Aristotle, however, as the 17th century showed, especially Descartes, whom I shall be speaking of in my second part, lacked two central elements of modern scientific rationality. The need for a mathematical formulation of empirical scientific results Plato loved mathematics, Aristotle did not. Plato, Aristotle loved empirical observation, Plato did not. You need both of them. And the need not only for observation, <coughs> which he perfected in the first research academy, the Lyceum, but for testing, <coughs> which he performed, I would say, only minimally, 
and often not at all, which is why by many contemporary scientists he's not considered really a scientist. Just didn't do testing. Aristotle, however, had one rational advantage over the most modern descriptions of scientific rationality, with certain great exceptions like Einstein. Namely, he had a strong assertion beyond empirical discursive reason of contemplative metaphysical intuitive reason, contemplative reason, as the final form of reason, which most modern thinkers in rationality do not. Which is why I say mysticism can so help this conversation. <laughs> Unlike his mentor Plato, and later Neoplatonists who so influenced Christian, Jewish, and Islamic theologies, especially Plotinus, Aristotle lacked a sense of contemplative mystical reason. He had metaphysical contemplation, but not mystical, as Plato did. In both its cognitive and erotic and agopic forms, what Aristotle did strongly hold in both his metaphysics and at the very end, speaking of what is a good life as a philosophical life of the Nicomachean ethics. A contemplative way of a philosophical life is not only Plato and Plotinus, it's Aristotle as well, and most of pre-scientific understandings of reason. Now, modern scientific rationality is a complex and pluralistic contribution to reason itself, of course. It also has certain ambiguities, principally, in my opinion, in the paradox of the enormous intellectual and practical, that is, technological successes it has achieved and continues to achieve. So highly successful has modern techno-scientific rationality been for all of us, that it is too often misinterpreted by too many, even a few theologians, should know better, as the only form of reason, with a resultant tragic narrowing of the notion of classical reason and elimination of contemplative reason <coughs> and reason for such people as the so-called new atheists reduced to mere scientism, not science, scientism, the only form of reason for them. Or a false positivism intellectually producing an exclusivist notion of rationality <coughs> as purely instrumentalist and reality itself as exclusively materialist. Now, modern rationality of this sort has been challenged by modern rationalists like Jürgen Habermas in his powerful critique of positivism and instrumentalism as understandings of reason. When rationality becomes exclusively positivist, scientistic, and instrumentalist, the results, I believe, are all around us and are tragic. Art becomes marginalized. Nice if you like it. No truth claim. Religion becomes privatized. No public claim to truth. And reason itself becomes instrumentalized. You can only discuss means to an end, no longer ends, as classical reason always did. <coughs> I'm skipping some so I don't go too long. It'll be in the written text. In the main male stream that defines our overcrowded, puzzling, and somewhat dangerous intellectual, political, and ecclesial moment, there are, as I noted above, several intellectual possibilities, including those many forms of reason 
that are grounded in the intellectual resources of both classical reason and modern scientific rationality, both of which need retrieval always. <laughs> These more inclusivist forms of rationality have <coughs> argued effectively, like Habermas, like Lanagan, against the narrowness of the range of much modern understanding of secularist scientific rationality. Oh, thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. Modern rationality, unlike classical reason, does not have the kind of distinctions you found before on reason, namely for the Greeks, theoria, for the Latins, contemplatio, for the medievals, intellectus, as distinct from ratio, for the German idealist, vernunft, as distinct from verstand, as well as the ever more encompassing forms of reason of mystical contemplatio. Where is that in modern rationality? I suggest that McGinn and others' work may restore it. Modern contemplatio, as Richard of St. Victor defined it, quote, a free and clear vision of the mind fixed upon the wisdom in suspended wonder. Modern reason could use that. <laughs> Mystical contemplation is both the widest and most intense form of contemplation. Mystical contemplation can encompass and promote intellectual and metaphysical forms of contemplation, both. <clears throat> Mystical contemplation is sometimes accompanied by a numinous, fascinating, and sometimes terrifying moment of shock. But it can also function in ordinary ways in everyday life. McGinn's definition of it as awareness saves it also for everyday life and takes away the attitude of weirdness that so many erroneously give it. Mystical contemplation, therefore, like intellectual contemplation, I mean, theoria, is less discursive, I think, in its form of reasoning than it is intuitive and receptive. It may but need not include intense, even overwhelming feelings, as in Schleiermacher who was a contemplative, I think. Like all contemplation, mystical contemplation is, of course, as Plotinus and Augustine argued, partly a matter of inner experience, as the soul in Augustine's famous spatial and temporal images <coughs> moves within in order to move above. However, mystical consciousness is not only an inner experience, but is in fact, philosophically and theologically, an objective event of being itself. Event has replaced substance, in my judgment, as the principal ontological category. Whitehead et al., Heidegger. In, and in Christian mystical contemplation, it is important to see <coughs> that the wisdom of God's own self can be joined particip in participation to the human self as a Mago Dei through Christ and in the spirit and with the community of the Christian church. Classical reason among the Greeks begins with cosmic speculations of the profound early Greek philosophers misnamed the pre-Socratics. Why are they named pre-Socratics? We don't call Hegel or Kant pre-Hegel. <laughs> They're great philosophers on their own. With Socrates, cosmic speculations yielded to a public dialogical search 
for definitions of human virtues, what is justice, what is temperance, what is piety, what is courage, etc. <laughs> Plato, in turn, cultivated a new form of reason, his brilliant, he's both an artist and a philosopher, artistic and philosophical dialogue, especially in the great middle dialogues, the Phaedrus, the Republic, and the Symposium. To demonstrate the full power of reason in its full, for him, mathematical, discursive, erotic, artistic, dialectical, and contemplative forms. And for Plato, I believe, as Vestugier shows, contem the contemplation is both metaphysical and mystical. <coughs> Alfred North Whitehead <coughs> made two famous generalizations that I rather liked. The first was, Christianity was a religion in search of a philosophy, and it found one. It's called theology. Buddhism is a, is a philosophy in search of a religion, and it found one. Visit any Buddhist culture, and you will see. The second, perhaps more pertinent tonight, <coughs> that all Western theology, philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Basically true. What, or anti-Plato. One of the most influential Platonic footnotes was called Aristotle, his student. <coughs> Now, despite Aristotle's sometimes strong criticism of his teacher, Plato, on certain central Platonic issues like the forms, Aristotle remained, in many important ways, a Platonist. As I mentioned already, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Book 10, and in the Metaphysics, like Plato, he emphasizes the deepest form of reason is contemplative reason. Aristotle, not only Plato, <coughs> by which he means, of course, not mystical reason, mystical contemplation, as Plato did. <coughs> Aristotle famously said that the mysteries, the famous mysteries that many undertook, I think Plato certainly did, and I doubt if Aristotle did, was an experience but not knowledge. For Plato, both metaphysical contemplation and mystical contemplation, as in the mysteries, was an experience to be sure, as, or as McGinn more accurately says, an awareness of the presence in the mysteries of the ultimate. In the, uh, not only experience, but it was knowledge. Now, of course, centuries later, it was Plotinus who made the needed philosophical and mystical breakthrough on reason. Suddenly, Plato's one of the Parmenides and his good beyond being of the Republic and the beautiful of the Symposium become in the hands of Plotinus properly also rightly called infinite. The union of these concepts, infinite and perfect being, as an Anselm, defined a major aspect of much Western Christian thought on religion, mysticism, and God. From Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine through Dionysius the Areopagite and Maximus the Confessor, and in the middle period, John Scotus Eriogena, and Simon Aquinas, Bonaventure, all of whom Professor McGinn has given the real substance of. Experts in each of these figures said, he's the one. <laughs> he did it and made them part of the larger tradition. I'm just saying they should be made part also of the debates on rationality. <laughs> and above all for me, on, the, in, on God is infinite, Duns Scotus in early modernity 
to Nicholas of Cusa, and I'll show in the second part to Descartes himself, the founder of modern reason, and Fenelon and Guillon, the two great mystics of love, from Leibniz and Spinoza to Hegel, Schleiermacher, and Schelling to Rana, Simone Weil, Pannenberg, and many others. I mean, God is infinite. It starts with Scotus. Scotus says it's the first name of God. I agree. <laughs> the modern analytical, logical, and modern scientific rationality, which I repeat, I totally affirm, once it becomes familiar anew with the resources of classical reason, which many thought they could put behind them in modernity, by a recovery, as, as happens now, of the notion of dialogue as more encompassing than argument, though you need both, as in Gadamer. An intellectual metaphysical contemplation, as you find in Whitehead, Heidegger, Lanard, and many others, <coughs> with classical reason, of classical reason, could also find in mystical contemplation, I'm suggesting, real resources for reason as a few thinkers, Simone Weil, for example, realized when she said, when she constantly reads Descartes and Kant and Plato, and said that John of the Cross is the scientific understanding of mysticism. Not that. Of the knowledge forthcoming from how mysticism is intimated love mysticism in the famous sayings of Gregory the Great, amor ipse notitia est. Love itself is knowledge. Or William of Santerie, who I dared to write an article on, intellectus amoris. <clears throat> now there is no good reason that I can see why modern rationality without loss of its affirmations of the worthwhileness and achievements of modern scientific, mathematical, logical, and technological re re rationality, cannot also find accessible the too often ignored rich resources of classical reason, especially on dialogue as distinct from argument, without loss of argument, an ancient dialectic as distinct from modern dialectic <coughs> and for intuitive, receptive reasoning, which the ancients knew as contemplation. If these entirely reasonable moves were made, then modern rationality, more in the manner of Descartes' affirmation of modern scientific reasoning as itself open to contemplation, including for Descartes implicitly mystical contemplation of the idea of the God is infinite in Meditation 3, rather than the second great founder of modern rationality, Kant's all too influential and somewhat petulant dismissal of all mysticism as nonsense bearing no knowledge at all, unlike his purely ethical faith. <laughs> it is true that for some claims for mysticism, Kant is usually thinking of Swedenborg, are elusive, elusive, and at times elusive. <laughs> However, most mystical forms of contemplative knowledge from Plato forward Pace Kant, who is a great figure, I love him, but not on this. The entirely rational enterprise is at the limit, as well as reasonably beyond the limits of reason, such as contemplative mysticism, function at the best and highest. Schleiermacher's emancipatory early notion of religion, better than his later notion in my opinion, 
as a sense and taste of the infinite. You don't have to be a Christian to have that, <coughs> but it helps. <laughs> Remains an excellent understanding, in my judgment, a form of religion open to any reasonable person, including for Schleiermacher, the cultural despisers of religion, as he called them. The best fundamental theologians, Ron or Lonergan, Pannenberg, Louis Dupre, Pepper Beck, Kevin Hoff, John Markey, and others, have argued, usually from critical reflections on what I've called limit questions, limit experiences, and limit situations. <clears throat> At the limit of science, after all, there lurks. The inevitable limit question which science on its own cannot answer. How can science function? if the universe is not in some fundamental way intelligible, even coherent. Morality also includes a limit question. Why be moral at all? Is a question that morality, ethics on its own, does not respond to. It's a limit question. Moreover, in everyday life, at one point or another, we have all experienced limit situations and limited experiences, often tragic, sometimes purely joyful, <coughs> that provoke new thought. Is life worthwhile or meaningful at all, or is it absurd, ultimately, and meaningless? These limit questions experienced in the death of, ones, of those one loves and one's own facing death, can be either tragic or joyful, limit situations, and at certain times in one's life haunt any sensitive, thinking human being. Dostoevsky did not call these questions, as I do, limit questions, but perhaps had a much stronger and better word for them, the Russian Jusha. These accursed questions which no honest person can long avoid. Now these questions and experiences, I believe, should be called religious questions. Disclosing a religious dimension to human life, like an aesthetic dimension or an ethical dimension or a metaphysical dimension. <coughs> the religious dimension to life need not be an explicit religion, can be denied only only if some forms of modern rationality, often called scientism, positivism, instrumentalism, are alone allowed to define reason. And questions, including the limit questions, that reason must address. If you eliminate such questions, you may also conclude with some of these versions long versions of modern reason, rationality, that reality is exclusively materialist. The mystical tradition speaks directly to these issues on rationality and reason. <coughs> and I would like, therefore, in the second part, to use one example, often I've written on the example of Gregory of Nyssa, who has both a philosophical notion of God as infinite in his early work and a mystical notion in his later work, as well as Augustine and many others. But I, since I'm talking about modern rationality and its problems, I thought it would be better perhaps to talk about one of the great two founders of modern rationality, Rene Descartes, and the reading of Descartes' position by Fenelon and Guillaume, the mystics. What relevance, if any, has philosophy, Descartes' philosophy to the question of the relationship of metaphysics, theology, and spirituality, and at the limit, mysticism? The answer is not obvious. The first problem is, so far we lack text, they're always finding new letters, the scholars of Descartes, 
to clarify Descartes' exact relationships to the now classical mystical spirituality of the 17th century, he said. Many historians do cite Descartes' clearly friendly relationships to the Berulians, including Cardinal de Bérou, one of the founders of 17th century spirituality. <coughs> Starting with the famous meeting of the young Descartes at the Papal Nuncio in Paris. Most intelligent people at the period, including Cardinal de Bérou and the Papal Nuncio, realized that scholasticism, which they meant Swarasian scholasticism of the period, could not answer the new questions provoked by the scientific revolution. There was need, as everyone said, for a new philosophy for theology. <coughs> Someone who claimed to have a new philosophy presented it at that famous meeting, well, in the two party he was present, and everyone applauded except the young Descartes. And Birul asked him, uh, what's the matter? He said, he's wrong. <laughs> and he went through every one of the things and refuted them. And Birul said, young man, come to my office tomorrow morning. <laughs> and he did. And it's Birul told Descartes, who was actually in the military and very gallant in his early life, you need quiet. <laughs> Leave Paris go to a quiet place and get us the new philosophy we need. He did, he went to Holland, to ever smaller villages in Holland. <laughs> and he developed his great philosophy. We don't know, we know he remained friends with the Berulians, but we don't know how mystical his thought was. He certainly was open to it. Descartes was a person of strong Catholic faith. That's clear. Indeed, occasionally, as example, at the conclusion of the famous third meditation on God is infinite, Descartes will break into what sounds almost like Anselm, with shifting from propositions to praise, language of praise to the infinite God. Or as many French phenomenologists like Jean-Luc Marion and Jean-Louis Chrétien now do in shifting from proposition, language of proposition to language of praise. <clears throat> in such moments, and by the way, this is not said in most histories of philosophy about Descartes. He's read usually as a pure rationalist of a cogito. He's not. He's a theologian of the, he's a philosopher of the infant. He influenced everyone, of course, just as Kant later did. <laughs> For a more explicit mystical reading of what Descartes contemplated and is contemplative in the third meditation as the infinite, and in the fifth meditation he joins it to the famous ontological argument. <laughs> I think one should turn to someone well known as a mystic and theologian, but not as a philosopher but he was a very good philosopher. He understood Descartes in a way that Malbranche, in my judgment, and Spinoza, in my judgment, did not. <laughs> That's debatable, of course. Fenelon and his mystical teacher, Jean Guillon, were major metaphysical thinkers in the period. Both were mystics, especially, of course, Guillaume, and theologians, especially, of course, Fenelon, though Guillaume was also theological. <clears throat> but they worked well together. Throughout uh, Catholic history, there were these many men-women dialogue partners, extraordinary, Francis of Assisi, and Claire, Fenelon and Guillaume, Francis de Sales. <laughs> and in our own day, I've always been fascinated by uh, 
Hans-Jürgen von Balthasar and uh, Adrian von Speer. He always said his theology is from her. He took dictation. So did Fenelon with Guillaume. Both were mystics, I suspect, as is too seldom recognized in histories of religion, as well in histories of philosophy and theology alike. Fenelon is widely acknowledged as a good theologian. He is less acknowledged as, in fact, a first-rate Cartesian philosopher. Indeed, indeed, in an age when all the major thinkers were giving diverse and often conflicting interpretation of Descartes' new philosophy, beginning of modern philosophy. He was also involved, of course, in the scientific revolution and the mathematizing of science. <coughs> Excuse me. What was needed was the new philosophy he provided that could be linked to the idea of God as infinite with Duns Scotus and the French spiritual tradition of the period and to the logic of perfection, the all-perfect God of Anselm and Fuller. As with other Augustinian traditions in the 17th century, often called the century of Augustine, Descartes, like Augustine, turned inward to the cogito in his case. His famous cogito ego sum possessed <coughs> real affinities as he later realized, he did not when he wrote it, but he later realized, a friend showed him, to Augustine's si follower sum. If I'm wrong, I am. Moreover, the platonic side of Descartes, what I would call his contemplative side, allowed him to affirm with both Augustine and the Dionysian tradition that the innate idea of God is infinite and the idea of God as incomprehensible imply each other. God is incomprehensible because God is infinite, not the reverse. Now, no one did more to provide modern rationality with its Understand, self-understanding than Descartes until Kant. <laughs> and most interpreters, very revealing, tend to ignore that he affirms contemplative reason in the central part of the meditations on God as infinite. <laughs> and Descartes was surely right to insist that theology in its apologetic role, today it would be called natural theology or fundamental theology, should argue metaphysically in both dialectical reason and contemplative reason. <coughs> if you're interested in more on Descartes, it will be in the written text. I have to move on. What time is it? Oh, 10 minutes. All right. <laughs> Metaphysics is a mode of thinking based both on dialectical argument and an intellectual contemplative intuition, which is certainly not identical, but is related to mystical contemplative intuition an intuition of the direct presence of God. Furthermore, whether metaphysics of the infinite, whenever rather, metaphysics of the infinite is transformed beyond the natural limits of reason toward a Christic understanding of God in God's self-manifestation in the event and person of Jesus Christ as received by both individuals and whole ecclesial communities with the faith, hope, and love that a metaphysics of the infinite God, not only in systematic and practical theology, but if I'm right, once you rethink reason, also in fundamental theology can be transferred. <coughs> 
<coughs> Bernard Lonergan was characteristically precise when he described faith as, quote, a new knowledge born of love. Fides Quirin's intellectum allows a theologian to affirm that the infinite and therefore incomprehensible God of metaphysics can, through the revelation, the cataphatic revelation, of Jesus Christ in the Spirit, yield to an understanding of the one infinite God who is love, and as love is constituted in the divine oneness by three infinite subsistent relations. The Father, love, the Son, beloved, the Spirit, the bond. <coughs> A new metaphysics of the infinite therefore can affirm and can work with modern rationality. There's nothing unreasonable about it. <coughs> can affirm with Plato, the end of the Republic, what dialectic could not reach for Plato, but it can happen, the good beyond being, as Levinas rightly calls that moment in Plato, one of those instants merveilleux, one of those marvelous instances in the history of thought, just happened. And it's a mystical insight. <coughs> Moreover, a metaphysically informed theology of the infinite, like Descartes in the third meditation, can also open, as in Fenelon, to a mystical faith and a mystical form of contemplation related to metaphysical contemplation and to all rationality in the modern and the classical sense that is born of a desire constituting the self-grounding, self-giving, purely generous, spontaneous love as a giving of itself. The infinite love that Fenelon learned basically first from Guillaume in her amazing mystical experiences, led like so many before him Dionysus the Areopagite, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Francis de Sales, etc., <coughs> is an awareness of the infinite God who is infinite is necessarily incomprehensible since the infinite God is an excess of both intelligence and love. God as pure, unbounded love as in Wesley's famous hymn. The God is the God of mystical pure love and graced passive contemplation as expressed above all mystically in Jean-Marie Bouvier de la Motte Guillon and in philosophical and explicitly theological terms in Francois de Salignac de la Motte Fenelon, they were sort of cousins. It sometimes joined, sometimes separate efforts. This extraordinary dialogue between Guillaume and Fenelon produced a reading of Descartes, which Descartes could have approved, he was dead by then, <coughs> and can be incorporated into modern rationality as it was in the beginning of modern rationality with Descartes. The more one reads the correspondence of Fenelon and Guillaume, as well as their individual writing, the more clearly it is how deeply they learned from each other. The Cartesian philosopher and theologian Fenelon learned to affirm the powerful reality of mysticism of love in Guillaume while Guillaume was happy to learn the highly erudite philosopher and theologian Fenelon, as well as his rhetorical abilities to help her with some of her excessive rhetoric. She admits it too. Well, to echo 
Fenelon's Cartesian philosophy, the beginning, I repeat, of modern rationality. Following John Scotus in theology on God as infinite and Benoit de Conferro in spirituality, and some Berulian probably, Fenelon philosophically developed Descartes' metaphysical contemplative emphasis as the first and most important form of contemplation, as Scotus earlier argued, <clears throat> and as open intrinsically and naturally to metaphysical, I mean to mystical contemplation. <clears throat> Furthermore, in the century of Augustine, repeat the century of the 17th century, that's called the century of Augustine, most French philosophers and theologians, they were the main philosophers of the period, argued over who was more faithful to the polysemic, inexhaustible texts of Augustine. Augustine's early more nature-grace, neoplatonic, and dialogical texts like De Magistro and De Libro Arbitrio were along with the Confessions and the mystically contemplative, to me his greatest text on the Trinity, De Trinitate, were central for Fenelon. They were not for the Jansenists who preferred the late Augustine on sin and grace. <coughs> well. As the great intellectual historian of the period, Henri Boudier, has observed, a good deal of 17th century arguments in philosophy and theology were either an attempt to Cartesianize Augustine, like Malebranche, or Augustinize Descartes, like Bérulle, Arnaud, and Fenelon. It shows, I think, that interesting 17th century debate how modern rationality can, without loss, I repeat, of its rich tradition of scientific reasoning, begin to incorporate again the metaphysical contemplation of classical reason. Not only Plato, also Aristotle, and as they missed, Descartes, <coughs> and mystical reason, contemplation, mystical contemplation. That would be a new day in the debates on rationality and on the use of reason in theology in the discussions of reason and faith. <clears throat> when rationality becomes exclusively scientistic, not scientific, positivist and instrumentalist, the results, I repeat, are tragic. May I repeat them, since they seem important to notice. Art is no longer allowed any truth value, as it has, say, in Heidegger, or Dewey, or many others. It's marginalized, something you do if you like it. Religion has no public value, no public truth value because you can't discuss ends anymore publicly with a narrow notion of rationality. <clears throat> you can only discuss means. So religion is privatized, and what I'm emphasizing tonight is not sufficiently emphasized. Modern rationality becomes, as Habermas and others rightly argue, purely instrumentalized so that the resources of classical reason, especially the contemplative resources, and the reality of mystical contemplation, which is highly reasonable in fact, are ignored or rejected. Ignored by most, rejected by Kant and his influence. Well, <clears throat> as many scholars have noted, Werder McGinn's extraordinary scholarship on mysticism and apocalypticism 
and Thomas Aquinas, <coughs> has allowed what is happening more widely, as many here tonight, I think, the relationship of spirituality in theology. And as spirituality, as Sandra Schneider so does, a distinct discipline also. My present lecture has suggested that McGinn's scholarship on mysticism as an awareness of the presence of God also allows for a rethinking of modern rationality, <coughs> especially as it is employed in philosophy and theology. Mystical contemplation is in complete harmony with metaphysical contemplation as Plato, from the, as Plato shows, among many others. And there is no reason, I repeat, reason, <laughs> for reason to ignore that fact and not use the resources so available, as McGinn shows time after time, uh, I'm adding resources for reason itself, including its use in theology. <clears throat> it seems to me that, metaf that mysticism and more generally spirituality become more, as they become more and more incorporated into theology, rightly, could also dare to enter the debate on reason and rationality and show that debate that classical reason could affirm both metaphysical and mystical contemplations as the highest form of reason itself, and modern rationality should not fear that fact. On this matter, on the two great founders of modern rationality, Descartes and Kant, Descartes was right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But I'd like it back because I'm fixing it still. <laughs> so are you open for some questions? Oh, sure. Good. Uh, if people, uh, for questions, if you would stand and uh, wait for the microphone so we can get everything on the uh, record. I hope you'll excuse my ignorance. I haven't had a theology or a philosophy course for the last uh, 50 years. But um, of all the people you've mentioned, have any of them reconciled the love of God with the cruelty of nature? Or if not, has, can you tell me of someone who has done that? The love of God with it? Well, there's no serious theologian and many a philosopher who ignore the problem of evil which would seem to incorporate the profound question you mentioned on the But is evil attributed nature. to humans? Excuse me? Is evil attributed to humans? It can be. It, to, if I can give you my own opinion, it is not, in my judgment, right to call what happens in nature, like tsunamis or hurricanes or horrible things, evil, perhaps even cruelty. It's natural events that have terrible effects upon reality, especially perhaps animals and human animals. Yeah, I'm thinking but more evil, of no. Evil to me means a relationship to human, either inherited sin, which I prefer to call it, original sin, as it's often, and personal sin. Those are evils. <laughs>
what happens in nature for me is not an evil and not cruel, it's just nature acting. I was thinking like of the, <coughs> of the uh, cr miserable lives of animals. Excuse me? I, I was thinking of the miserable lives that animals lead, like birds, you get, you oh. gotta stay away from them because they have fleas and they can't even scratch themselves. Yeah. So yeah. They're, they must be miserable. Yes. Um, does there, can you, could you tell me? I don't you? deny that or pain. I just deny the usefulness of calling that evil, either philosophically or theologically. Most do, I know, but I've argued elsewhere that it's not helpful to call. Uh, to, could you give me a name of someone I might read? On that? Yeah. Uh, who's good? Hartson is good on that. Charles, Charles Hartson. Process the philosophy and theology is usually rather good on those issues <laughs> because you have a different notion of God's relationship to nature there, which is needed. Okay, um, many years ago, more than I care to admit, Sorry. I um, had a position in a religious studies department, um, and I'm a social scientist. Yes. And the department was dominated by philosophers uh, who I would call positivists uh -huh. coming out of the social sciences. Yes. And they were deathly afraid that anybody would study religion and still be a believer in one. They, they saw that as uh, apologetics and unscientific. Yes. And they thoroughly condemned what I would do because I studied people who were religious yeah. and tried to understand them, even when yeah. they had different religions from mine yeah. or, or no religion. Yeah. Now, what um, kind of uh, dawns on me after being in that environment for a while was that while Theologians uh, use anthropomorphisms uh -huh. to talk about the divine out of necessity, and it is not a problem so long as they know they are anthropomorphisms. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <coughs> if we take a positive, as a, pro a positive approach to humanity, as these philosophers did, they would be thoroughly disempowered in the uh, theological they, you, would be disempowered. They would not have any uh, ability to understand ah. the divine, let alone the human, because they base we all base our knowledge of the divine on the human. Right. Now, my my question is, you know, you you are uh, kind of going down the line that uh, the lack of access to an awareness of the divine. Uh, is a defect in philosophy, hmm. whereas where I observed, and both of these can be true, is that a lack of awareness of the human narrows their philosophy down to the, the realm of ratiocination alone. Yes. And my, my question is, um, well, I okay. I agree fully with that. Which done. comes first? Uh, which is the cause of which? That's kind of my query, and I'm not sure there's an answer. Uh, which of the uh, the lack of um, awareness of humanity or the lack of awareness of divinity? Well, you may have noticed. I mean, I would have to say much more. But as you may have noticed, I'm with Scotus that the first name for God is not an anthropomorphic name. It's the infinite. When you get to infinite love, you get to Trinity which uses person, but not in a very anthropomorphic way. I think the Cappadocians, for example, how do you understand Trinity without, it would seem, anthropomorphic language of person? But if you understand what they actually meant by person, Greek prosopon, it meant the self, the individual, is constituted by its relations. So, that language, which can sound anthropomorphic, is not very anthropomorphic and can be used for the Trinitarian relations. The Latins didn't see that the word persona, 
is similar. Augustus did not see that. So the Latins tended to either use purely metaphysical language or anthropomorphic language. It, in many ways, it wasn't until modern philosophy of personalism that there was a recapturing of what I'm claiming. The Cappadocians saw first on Trinitarian grounds and then on anthropological grounds. And the Latins didn't win. It's also interesting the difference between the Greeks and the Latins for me. You notice the Greeks, it comes from the theater, prosopon. It's a mask. And the mask of the, say, tragic or comic character is towards the other. The other being the audience, the other being the chorus, the other being the other, uh, the other participants, actors. Right? Uh, in Latin, Latin, and so the, the Greeks are a visually oriented culture. That can sound purely anthrop, but it's not as they understood prosopon. The Latins with persona, it's personare, right? It's not visual, it's auditory. To hear through <laughs> personare, person. They could have used that, but they didn't see what the Greeks saw. So, you know, it's, it, your question is both important and interesting, and it's even more interesting, I think, to realize that you do not have to go to modern personalism, which does have a danger of anthropomorphism for divine language, but you could go back to, of all things, Trinitarian debates in the fourth century, where uh, the, that actually became not only then a, theological prosopon for the Trinity, it also became an ordinary word eventually for person. Because in, in the Catholic tradition too, persons are not individuals. Persons are individuals who are constituted by their relations. So the father is constituted by the relation to the son and so forth. And that seems to me, because your question and observation is profound, that as much as possible, we have to eventually, at times, like the Bible, use anthrop anthropomorphic language. But I don't think it should start with it, and I think, because it doesn't start with it, but starts with the infinite, and then can move into Trinitarian discussions with prosopa, you have a way of keeping the anthropomorphic language taking over. Does that make sense? <coughs> Thank you so much uh, for this really wonderful lecture. I'm wondering what is the role of the body in contemplative rationality? Ah. I got there by thinking about Paul. Of Paul. And I was thinking about Paul, uh, who had both an awareness of God's presence mm -hmm. and also participation in God's presence. Yes, yes. And I was thinking about how I think he speaks about living the way of the cross, when he says, you know, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, he's really talking yeah. about living the cross. Yes. And that becomes a way of thinking other things through for him. Through the cross. Y yeah, through the experience of yeah. living the cross. So I was thinking of really embodying yeah. that way. So I'm just thinking about a mystics, the mystical experience is both mental and physical. It is just indeed. Thought, yes. I was wondering about that. Well, I, I, I don't quite know what to say because I agree with everything you said. So I would just say thank you. <laughs> because the body is central issue. And more and more work has been done on it, especially by feminist thought. Especially. Now for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, Plato was not all that enthusiastic about the body. Uh, Aristotle was more so. <laughs> Remember for, well, but it still needs more work of the sort you suggest, and Paul is a good instance. <laughs> 
Ah, okay. great. Thank you. David. <laughs> yes, thank you. And thank you very much for a wonderful analysis and, and, and presentation, um, Dr. Tracy. I, I just, um, like you'd mentioned pre-modernism, you'd mentioned modernism, and I'm just wondering, uh, from your perspective, your kind of uh, vantage point at this point in time, uh, do you see anything in post-modernism that essentially wars against the loss of contemplative reason in any way? Like th you just mentioned feminism, for example, but outside the, the wonderful work that Bernie's doing on mysticism, right. is there any, any other public discourse that sort of overtly wars against this loss of contemplative reason that you could kind of point to? Yes. Um. <coughs> Some of those who are called postmoderns, Emmanuel Levinas, for example, defends contemplative reason and certainly defends the notion of the infinite via contemplative reason. Others, like Jacques Derrida, sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. Uh, I think I, I now, I'm old enough to remember existentialism which was very powerful in the 50s in my youth and Bernie's youth. I mean, we read all, they now are, still have many very good insights, but it's now more a historical reality, right? Camus still teaches us things, I don't think Sartre does, but Camus does, Du Beauvoir does, there, the things still, I now think, it's long enough, I've worked a lot on postmodern thinkers in my day, um, that post-modernity is becoming like that. A powerful and rich movement that now, rather than speak of it in general terms like existentialism, it's better to do the individual thinkers call. I, for example, think Jacques Lacan has a great deal to, to teach, including about mysticism in his discussions of what he calls jouissance, or his discussions of Augustine. It probably helped that his brother was a Benedictine who was a medievalist, but I find him, you know, Freud, Freud is like Kant, he's just against all that. I mean, it's nonsense for Freud, right? It isn't for Lacan, but it also doesn't become, for me, as mythologized as it does in you. It still remains more reasonable. Uh, Levinas, Derrida, Foucault. I mean, they all have things to teach one, I think. But they're things now that shouldn't be thought of as they too often are, as post-modernity says. Right? No, Lacan says this. How does that relate to what McGinn says about mysticism? That's a good question. <laughs> And he speaks of it in fact. Right? Uh, I especially like Levinas. And my friend uh, Adrian Pepperzak, who's one of the great experts on Levinas, uh, told me that once he, Pepperzak, gave a talk on John of the Cross, which Levinas attended. And Levinas said to him afterward, if that's mysticism, I'm for it. <laughs> Previously, he was against it, he thought. And I think that's why I emphasize the, the, the debate in reason and rationale. I think many philosophers who are not usually thoughtless just take for granted that Kant was right <laughs> or Freud was right. The postmoderns, to their credit, usually do not, both on the notion of rationality and on the notion of mysticism. And it seems to me they they help. Uh, I asked my friend Jean Luc Marion why he thought in the English speaking world and the German speaking world, courses I've had in my youth often sort of modernity with Kant. Great figure, of course, of course. I, I love him actually. But I said, why don't they start as obvious? They should start with Descartes as it starts in the French-speaking world, right? He said, well, they're not going to start with Descartes. He was French. 
and the Germans and the English are not about to admit that's where <laughs> modernity begins. I don't know if that's true, but there's something to it. I mean, why don't we have, uh, when you read the history of modern reason, which I'm talking about here, when it becomes after the scientific revolution, modern rationality, and with Kant then philosophically eliminates, he does not eliminate religion, as long as it's an ethical religion. Right? It's morality, basically, for him. But he eliminates mysticism, why? And Descartes does not, which the histories of philosophy I remember from my youth or even look at today, never mention. Descartes, for most histories of philosophy, I think it's accurate to say, especially in the English-speaking world, especially in Great Britain where they all write on Descartes, uh, is a philosophy of the cogito. Actually, the cogito in the first meditation, it's grounded in, by the third meditation on the infinite, not the reverse. Never even mentioned. The French do see that, or some the new scholarship. Um, and then if you try to link as I do, Marion told me that's original, perhaps, I don't know. If you try to link the Fenelon discussion of and Guillaume on mystical contemplation with the Descartes discussion on met metaphysical contemplation, I think you get somewhere in terms of how to provide a correction to the Kantian takeover of modern rationality, eliminating mysticism. Or in psychology, the Freudian takeover, which is not the case with Jung, of course, and is not the case with Lacan. It, you have to go almost discipline by discipline to see. Many theologians don't seem to speak much about reason but the whole culture does. <laughs> and philosophy, theology always did. Maybe because they sense that modern rationality is so narrow that you can't do much with it theologically. Perhaps. But I'm trying to say it need not be. Reason, rationality, too, can begin to incorporate not only metaphysical contemplation of classical reason, but mystical contemplation, which is even deeper. And that's not just, I mean, that's what Plato did, that's what Plotinus did, that's what Augustine did. I mean, why not rethink things from the point of view of reason? Dr. Dr. Trey people tell me I'm a rationalist, so maybe not. Yeah? Yes, please. Dr. Tracy, thank you. Your lecture seems to point to the first sentence in Genesis where scientists uh, study space, yeah. matter, and time. And then you have the mystical part where you have Elohim speaking uh, creation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Isaiah, yeah. uh, first Isaiah, I believe, then calls people uh, to reason with uh, our creator. Yes. And then you move into the Gospel of John and it appears that science and mysticism come together and the person of Jesus Christ for the Logos became flesh. Could you speak to the correlation of these two disciplines would come? You mean Genesis and John? Yes, sir. Or, or, no, I think what you say is perfectly right. You notice I quoted <laughs> theology as the Logos of Theos. And Logos does obviously mean both word and reason, including in John. The, uh, and after all, the Hebrew Bible or First Testament also includes the wisdom books. I'm always fascinated at how pluralistic the Bible is. I'm very happy we have four Gospels and not just one, <laughs> as many people act as if that's all there is. No, there are four. I was John, I think there are five, because of Paul. Paul is at least as influential as the other, as was mentioned back here. <coughs> I don't know if I'm responding or not. 
to your question. Yes, please. One yes. last question. Good evening, and thank you so much, Dr. Tracy. I'm Ainita Adesanya. I'm a doctoral student at the Graduate Theological ah, Union in Berkeley. Congratulations. And studying Christian spirituality, um, my pre-dissertation work has been centered around contemplation. Ah. And so I'm very excited about mystical contemplation because as I study um, contemplation, I keep stumbling upon mysticism. And so I've, I found my way into mysticism such that I'm here. Tonight, my question is, if, and I'm assuming you agree with Dr. McGinn, yes. that if mystical contemplation is the awareness of, and I close my book, the awareness of the presence of God, then what is, how are, how are we to look at contemplation itself? And I'm interested in digging at today's, sort of the contemporary uh, view of the end versus the means to the end in terms of contemplation and where the experience of the presence of God lie. Yes, I, I mentioned uh, Professor McGinn's choice of awareness from Lonergan rather than experience, though I'm like you, I gather, somewhat more sympathetic to experience once it's rethought. I think perhaps the greatest contribution of Anglo-American, especially American philosophy is on the notion of experience. Experience is still too much read in terms of British empiricism. That is to say, the experience of the five senses. The American, we're talking as far back as Edwards, <laughs> but also Emerson and then especially James and Whitehead and Dewey rethought the notion of experience to make it, allow it to incorporate awareness and incorporate feeling, mood, as Heidegger did in Phenomenology. I think that's a great contribution so that <coughs> even contemplation, if you speak of it as awareness, as I think is, is better so because as McGinn shows, then you can include the movement from experience to understanding to judgment, decision, et cetera, that Lonergan spells out. However, in my opinion, as I guess yours, experience is still a rich category if you make clear what you mean and do not mean by it. And one of the things that our mutual teacher Lonergan, in my opinion, was not good on, though some of his later um, interpreters like Robert Doran and others all are put on was experience. He spoke of it in terms largely of data. Lonergan was very scientific about it, and I don't. But I agree that it's a bit dangerous if you haven't thought out that it's not just empiricism. Right, does that make some sense? Here? And contemplation, I think, is such a rich concept. And you can't miss that it's in classical reason. And I see absolutely no reason why it couldn't be in modern reason. And it's beginning, that, that's why someone like Levinas can say, the good without being of Plato, that's contemplative uh, reason. He said, it's one of those marvelous instances in the history of thought. You don't know how it happened, but there it is. <laughs> well, the one in Plotinus. Uh, <coughs> or the notion of the infinite in Levinas himself and his distinction between infinity and totality. It's, I, I always thought, I used to talk to him quite a bit when he would visit Chicago or in conference. Derrida, I thought, was quite open to that. 